I'm Dr. Katherine Carriker Jaffe, a program director at RTI International. Today, I'm going to be talking about alcohol related disparities as part of the Research Society on Alcoholism's lecture series. I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague, also Dr. Karen Chartier from Virginia Commonwealth University. And as I get started, I want to acknowledge that I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And the views I express here are my personal thoughts and opinions based on research that I've conducted as well as research of others. In this presentation, I'm gonna start by introducing the idea of health disparities with some key terms and definitions. Then we're gonna look at some of the epidemiologic data on alcohol-related disparities in particular. We're gonna wrap up with a discussion of how we can move toward health equity looking at theories and interventions to reduce disparities across multiple levels of influence. When we talk about disparities, we often talk about race and ethnicity. Race refers to a person's physical characteristics, while ethnicity refers to cultural factors. These might be related to nationality, ancestry, language, other things like this. It's important to remember that race ethnicity is a social, not a biological classification. In the United States, race and ethnicity are often used as a proxy for social class, but these are really fundamentally different ideas. Moving forward in this presentation, I'm gonna use the terms whites, blacks, and Latinos. There are really a lot of variations and different preferences of different people. I also use the abbreviation AIAN to refer to American Indians and Alaska Natives. These groups are often aggregated in analyses for a variety of reasons. Alcohol studies that focus in on AIAN populations typically focus on American Indians and often use reservation-based samples. AAPIs refers to Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. These groups also are often aggregated in analyses, and alcohol studies focusing on AAPIs typically focus in on Asian Americans. We're also gonna talk about sex and gender disparities. Sex refers to biologically determined characteristics of females and males, and gender it refers to the socially constructed characteristics of women and men in our society. Gender identity, or how someone expresses their gender, might not match someone's biological sex assigned at birth. These people are known as transgender identity. And I'm not gonna address much around transgender health in this presentation. I will talk about sexual minority status, and this can be measured in terms of someone's own sexual identity, as well as behaviors or attractions that people report. An important concept to keep in mind is the idea of intersectionality. Individuals don't belong to one single social group, right? A person may identify with multiple social categories simultaneously. Social indicators together may independently or jointly affect risk for substance use and related problems. And together, these might result in greater disparities or fewer disparities, depending on the mix of characteristics and the particular situations. So what do the alcohol epidemiology data show us about alcohol-related disparities? There are several main national alcohol studies that I will be presenting findings from. The first is the National Epidemiologic Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions, or NISARC. This is funded by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, which also is known as NIAAA. There have been three NISARC surveys conducted since 2001. And the second survey, NISARC-2, included a follow-up of the NISARC-1 sample. Another large national survey is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, or NISDA. This is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and it's conducted yearly. NISDA includes people ages 12 and up, 
and it includes large youth and young adult samples in the most recent surveys. The final national data source I'll present from is the National Alcohol Survey. This is also funded by NIAAA, but it's administered through a grant to the Alcohol Research Group. And this survey is conducted every five years and it has over samples of Black and Latino respondents. Data from the 2019 NISDA showed that there's almost 140 million current drinkers in the United States. 47% of these drinkers were past month binge drinkers in 2019. Binge drinking for males is defined as drinking five or more drinks on the same occasion, at least on one day in the past 30 days. For females, binge drinking is defined as drinking four or more drinks on the same occasion. There's also 16 million people who are past month heavy drinkers. That represents 24% of current binge drinkers and almost 12% of current drinkers. And these are people who reported binge drinking five or more times in the past 30 days. I think it's important to point out that our national survey data show all of the racial ethnic groups have higher rates of lifetime abstinence from alcohol than whites. And this is particularly true among women. The gray bars are lifetime abstainers the blue bars are people who reported drinking in the year leading up to the interview, and the yellow bars are ex-drinkers, or people who used to drink but did not drink at all in the year before the interview. American Indian men also have higher rates of stopping drinking or being ex-drinkers than whites and most other groups. When we look only at past year drinkers compared to whites, Latinos show higher rates of some indicators of high intensity drinking, such as having eight or more drinks on one occasion. And American Indian drinkers show even higher rates of high intensity drinking. Here we also show data for 12 plus drinks on an occasion and 24 plus drinks on an occasion, which are not very common, but still very detrimental drinking patterns. We also look at alcohol use disorder or people's experiences with physical and social and health problems related to their drinking. NISARC data show that American Indian groups are more likely to report current AUD as well as lifetime AUD compared to other racial ethnic groups. Variations in alcohol problems among groups are often products of social, economic, and environmental circumstances. And when we see inequitable differences, these are called disparities. For example, some data indicate that alcohol use disorder is more persistent among Blacks and Latinos compared to whites. There's an analysis of NISARC longitudinal data that showed the persistence of prior dependence to past year alcohol dependence was 23% for whites, but 35% in Blacks and 33% in Latinos. There also are sex differences and gender disparities. For example, we know that women drink less and have far fewer alcohol problems than men. Men are about two and a half times more likely than women to develop alcohol use disorder. And these differences tend to be magnified in Blacks and Latinos and Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but these gender differences are seen less among AIAN adults. Racial ethnic minority women, sexual minority women, and women of lower socioeconomic status are more likely to experience disparities in alcohol outcomes. specifically turning to disparities by sexual orientation and identity. National survey data from the NISARC and the NAS suggest disparities by sexual identity are most pronounced among women. Lesbian women, they're three to seven times more likely than heterosexual women to drink heavily or develop alcohol use disorder. 
And data show no differences, or in some cases, less risk for sexual minority men compared to heterosexual men. Data from youth show similar disparities for sexual minority women with no disparities for young men. And disparities are even larger among sexual minority women who also are racial ethnic minorities. And globally, the harmful use of alcohol causes 3 million deaths a year, and alcohol is responsible for 5% of the global burden of disease. National data shows significant disparities in alcohol-related health conditions. American Indians and Alaska Natives experience far worse health overall and higher alcohol attributable mortality and morbidity compared to all other major racial ethnic groups in the country. Latinos have substantially higher rates of liver cirrhosis compared to whites, and Asians who exhibit a flushing response when they drink are at high risk of esophageal cancer if they do choose to drink. Women also experience higher rates of health problems from alcohol use than men. These include alcohol-related liver disease, certain types of cancers, other chronic health problems, and cognitive problems due to alcohol use. So can we turn to treatment to reduce disparities? We have consistent evidence of effective specialty substance abuse treatment these are the programs that are specifically designed to treat substance use disorders, including alcohol use disorder. However, less than 10% of people with a lifetime alcohol use disorder report ever having access to treatment. When we look at differences in treatment use by race, ethnicity, and gender, we see that for all groups except Black men, racial ethnic minorities are less likely than their white counterparts to access treatment. This is especially true for Black and Latino women who are in the two right-hand bars on these three graphs. The left-hand set of bars shows the use of any treatment services by people reporting lifetime alcohol use disorder. And then the middle graph is broken into specialty treatment and the right-hand graph focuses on informal treatment like Alcoholics Anonymous or other 12-step or mutual health programs in the community. And we see the same pattern of disparities across these different types of treatment. So can we turn to theories to help explain these differences that we're observing? There are important theories focused on health disparities that can illuminate some of these pathways to differences. There's a set of psychosocial theories that focuses in on people's perceptions and experiences of their status in unequal societies and how that leads to stress and poor health. A lack of resources held by individuals themselves, but also systematic underinvestment across a wide range of community infrastructure, including the second set of theories focuses on the social production of disease. These are also called the political economy of health theories. They emphasize that the effect of income inequality on health represents both a lack of resources held by individuals, but also systematic underinvestment across a wide range of community infrastructure. Finally, there's a set of eco-social theories and related multi-level frameworks that integrate social and biological factors within dynamic, historical, and ecological perspective that takes into account everything from cellular level to human societal groupings. Specifically related to alcohol disparities, we know that health disparity groups can be exposed to many different kinds of stressors. These include discrimination, poverty, unemployment, violence, residential segregation, substandard housing, and decreased access to healthcare, including alcohol treatment. There's a family of theories used in alcohol research that really converge on a hypothesis that stress exposure contributes to health risk behaviors, including heavy alcohol use. Epidemiologic data suggests that exposure to stressors really does matter. 
Studies have associated greater odds of alcohol misuse and problems with racial ethnic discrimination, poverty, unemployment and homelessness, exposure to childhood maltreatment, as well as neighborhood poverty and disadvantage. There also are studies showing that these effects are interactive. So people with more than one of these stressors are at increasingly higher risk of problems. So what can we do to reduce alcohol-related disparities? Inequalities in health are socially determined and they prevent populations from moving up in society and making the most of their potential. Health equity is defined as the absence of unfair and avoidable differences in health among these population groups that are defined socially, economically, geographically, or demographically. When we pursue health equity, we have to strive for the highest possible standard of health for all people, giving special attention to the needs of those at greatest risk of poor health based on social condition. So action requires not only equitable access to health care, but also we have to work outside the healthcare system to address broader well-being and development. There's also a nice socioecological framework for explaining alcohol-related disparities. Individual level factors that influence alcohol use related to some of the characteristics that we've talked about here are nested within a microsystem of home, work, and school environments. And these in turn are nested in the larger community, which includes norms and attitudes regarding alcohol, cultural norms, gender norms, and things like this. And macro level factors, including exposure to advertising, may influence all of these internal levels that ultimately affect individual attitudes and behaviors. If you are a healthcare provider, there are things you can do to help advance health equity and reduce social determinants of health. The American Academy of Family Physicians recommends developing a practice culture that values health equity. Providers can make an effort to understand patients' communities and learn how social determinants impact health outcomes. They can work to address implicit bias, as we all can, and build cultural competency, providing care in patients' preferred languages. Also, taking a team-based approach for addressing social determinants of health is important. Providers can ask patients about their social determinants and screen for social risk factors. Then they can identify resources in patients' communities that can help meet these needs, and they can act to help connect their patients with resources to address vulnerabilities. And if you'd like more information on drinking or finding alcohol treatment, please check out these websites sponsored by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Thank you for your attention today. And thank you to my collaborators, Dr. Karen Chartier and Dr. Sarah Zemore from the Alcohol Research Group of the Public Health Institute. I'll leave you with some key references that I used when preparing my presentation for you today. Thank you.